Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Goshia, for, for this very kind introduction and, and um, very well welcome to all of you from Warsaw. We have indeed, uh, not, not a very early morning, but still, you know, we are before noon, we are, you are, you have already enjoying your evening, as I understand. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's very nice to, uh, to, to have this opportunity to, to talk to you about a topic which is very, you know, close to my heart and, and I'm, I'm, Every day, following uh, European uh, politics, um, Polish foreign policy, Poland's um, uh, predicaments in the in the European Union, and so on and so forth, and and there is indeed, I think, a lot to to talk about. I think the immediate inspiration for for this for this meeting was an an, an article I recently published in. Uh, Gazeta Wyborcza, trying to analyze uh, how Poland lost its foreign policy compass. And I will be very happy to uh, talk a little bit more about that uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. But uh, in order to make you familiar with a more general overview and, and, and full picture of, of the, you know, Poland's um, the developments in the Polish foreign and European policy, I would start with uh, perhaps not with the, with, with the big geopolitics and, and relations with China, the US, Russia, and so on and so forth, but rather uh, to uh, spend a couple of minutes on, uh, on how, um, how the parameters of, um, or, or the, maybe not the parameters, the, the circumstances um, under which the Polish uh, position uh, in uh, in the EU and in the world um, has been changing um, over the last uh, few years. Um, and that's why I would like to start with the European Union, because as you know, this is the, the main of reference for, for Poland and uh, for, for Poland's place in the world. This ambition to join the European Union and NATO, that was the main foreign policy compass for, for Poland um, over the last uh, three decades, as you very well know. And uh, that was basically this, this desire to, to become part of the West um, um, and of these two institutions was uh, basically inspiring the whole Poland foreign policy since um, 1989. And this is, um, this is why it is so important to understand how uh, the European Union evolves these days and what it means for Poland. Because I, my, my first argument is, or my first point is that uh, what we are witnessing today is a major transformation of the European Union and, and a transformation uh, with which Poland is, uh, or this transformation Poland is very often at odds with it. And, and I think this is the main challenge today for, for, for Poland um, in Europe and, and in the world. And what I mean by this uh, deep transformation of the European Union, uh, if you if you look back uh, and at the at the time um, of the Polish accession to the European Union, uh, we perceived the European Union in Poland as an instrument or as an organization which had one uh, major goal, and this one major goal was to. Um, overcome divisions in the European, in, in Europe, to overcome divisions, political divisions, geopolitical divisions, and uh, economic divisions. So the the in, indeed, uh, when you look at the history of the European integration, the very ration, the, the the main rationale of this project uh, was uh, exactly this: the France and Germany. Uh, got united in this desire to overcome the divisions um, uh, provoked not just by the Second World War, but, but also previous uh, conflicts. Uh, and in the 50s, this project was about peace. It was about, uh, as I said, overcoming divisions, uh, unifying European nations. 
And then in the in the late eighties, early nineties, um, the, the the desire, the goal of uh, putting an end to the Cold War division in the European Union in, in Europe was the the main driving force of the European integration, and, and Poland benefited from that. And then when we joined the European Union in two thousand four, we benefited again from from this uh, goal of of economic convergence. Uh, basically, the, the, the EU funds, the, the whole policy of the European Union was very much focused on, uh, on um, uh, minimizing or, or getting rid of the uh, um, economic uh, divide in, in Europe. And if you look at the European Union today, you may have the impression, or even more than that, that this is no longer actually the main driving force of the European Union. This is, of course, economic convergence and bringing people together. It's still an important goal of the EU, but today the European Union is facing uh, a number of challenges which are of a different nature than those challenges the EU was facing uh, in the previous decades. Because previously, the EU, as I said, was a response to, to some internal European challenges. War, divergence, Cold War, and so on and so forth. Now, the the main driving force of the European integration is to respond to the external challenges, to the, to the, to the challenges of, um, of the climate change, of uh, the uh, mm, uh, geopolitical rivalry between the U US and China. Uh, mm, th there, is, uh, there, there are, uh, of course, challenges of migration, uh, and so on and so forth. So, this is this is a different a different setup, and the European response is basically twofold. Or when it comes to the to the EU, new priorities which developed under this um, under these new circumstances. These new priorities are to build up uh, what we call uh, European sovereignty. So. Uh, bringing the European Union even closer together, the EU member states, by developing tools of uh, reaction or coercion, um, external sanctions uh, imposed by various uh, powers, um, um, like especially China, but also US, uh, an ambition to, to develop a more cohesive foreign and security policy. Mm, um, but especially, I think the, the, the key European project these days is the green transformation. So this is, uh, you, we have a Green New Deal, which is a major uh, project of, uh, of the EU, uh, basically stimulating all other policies uh, of the European Union. So basically, the main ambition of the EU today is not to put an end to the internal divisions in the EU or in Europe, but rather to completely redesign the European economic model towards uh, uh, renewables, towards uh, um, zero emissions economy 2050, and towards digitalization. So these are the priorities, the new priorities of the EU, and, and to defend uh, by means of this uh, newly developed uh, kind of, uh, you know, um, European sovereignty, um, uh, to defend Europe's place in the world. And I think this is, I, I, you, may, you may think that it is sort of unrelated <laughs> with, with, with the topic of our, uh, our conversation here, Poland's European policy, but, but I think the opposite is true. This, is what, what, uh, this, this exactly sets the parameters, this development the EU sets parameters for the Poland's European and foreign policy. Because 
I said in the beginning that, that Poland's uh, orientation is in the EU or, or more largely in the world is to some extent at odds with this direction of the EU's development. Why is it so? Uh, obviously, Poland is still very much interested in uh, overcoming divisions in the European Union. So we, we still have not caught up uh, with the West or with Germany or with other um, uh, West European countries when it comes to the level of economic development. Uh, and it, it's not even in sight that we would uh, be able to do that. Uh, but at the same time, we need to face the next challenge, uh, which is the adaptation to the green transformation. And Poland is here uh, certainly um, a lager in the, in the European Union. It's a country which, which is struggling very much with, with this. It, is, uh, it has some uh, steps uh, or undertaken some steps uh, towards, you know, a acceleration of a transformation towards a low emissions economy, but it's still quite incoherent and, um, and, and not really very ambitious. And the, so the risk is, um, and I could give you even more, more examples of that, the risk is that um, uh, if we do not uh, really get our act together, and if we don't uh, design a more a coherent plan how to reach the EU goals, how to make sure that we meet criteria which will allow us to tap into the EU funds, uh, which are now very clearly uh, sort of tailored towards these, uh, toward the green transformation goals, that we basically miss the opportunity to benefit from the European project as we did over the last uh, 15 years. Because we, Poland was uh, or ha yeah, has been a, a main beneficiary of the EU integration over the last 15 years, but since the circumstances, since, since those parameters um, um, actually have already changed, we need to, to make sure that we are also among the beneficiaries in the next chapter of the European integra integration, which has just opened. And uh, so I think this is, this is a, a very, probably the main challenge for Poland today, how to make sure that, that, the, that we formulate our national goals uh, in a way which, uh, mm, as I said, mm, uh, are, that, that they are in, in line with the EU development, EU transformation, uh, so that we uh, basically have this harmony we benefited so much uh, in the previous years. And that brings me to, 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 to the second point I wanted to make, um, uh, also in, in relation with the EU, and, and, uh, and I think this is something which is also very, something you are certainly following very, um, very closely, and this is the, um, the collapse of the rule of law system in Poland. Because uh, this is again uh, not a purely internal political issue. Uh, this has major implications for our relations with our main partners in the EU and, and for our position in the European Union. As you certainly know, uh, there are already um, a couple of um, infringements, so called infringement procedures. Um, initiated by the European Commission against Poland before the European Court of Justice uh, for violations of the rule of law. Uh, the European Commission has been following the situation in Poland for, for, for years now, and uh, the developments, especially in the judiciary system, where, which is um, devoid of, of uh, systemic guarantees of judicial independence uh, is, is probably the main reason for, for concerns in, in, in Poland today. But there are, of course, many other uh, problems and, uh, and it, the, the whole situation basically 
uh, resembles what, what uh, social scientists call the system of grand corruption. Grand corruptions meaning not just uh, theft or, or, or fraud, but a system where basically uh, the, uh, the government, the, the ruling party, uh, is in control of the major uh, um, assets of the state and uh, of the main institutions and uh, this control uh, serves uh, its uh, its own policy goals um, and is uh, so that the, basically the uh, the whole state system is very much tilted towards the the interests of the of the ruling elite and and this is uh, this is what uh, what is of course a uh, a major uh, concern not just for for the liberal democratic uh, part of the polish society but as i said it creates a lot of uh, tensions and problems uh, within the european union and this is related uh, also very strongly to the to the situation i described before because uh, the the european union uh, um, the, this this new chapter uh, um, of the European integration I, I, I tried to define involves also an unprecedented level of intra-European solidarity. Last year, the European Union um, adopted um, um, something which is called uh, Recovery Fund. A recovery fund for the post-pandemic uh, economic uh, reconstruction. This is a, a fund uh, of seventy, uh, sorry, seven hundred fifty billion euro, which will be spent across the European Union um, in the next couple of years. And this is a, a, a additional fund uh, to the traditional European Union budget. So th this EU budget, Poland benefited a lot in the past. And Poland will be among those uh, main beneficiaries of, of this recovery fund, which was constructed. And this, this, this money, this fund is, is unprecedented for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the, the money will come from um, a program of uh, uh, EU guaranteed bonds. Uh, which has never happened uh, um, on this scale uh, so far. So this is this unprecedented element. And this money will be also very easily accessible uh, without major bureaucratic controls uh, from the EU uh, because uh, the EU is, is very much determined, I mean, the EU institutions are very much determined to spend the money as, as quickly as possible uh, in order to uh, trigger um, economic development and, and economic recovery, which is so badly needed in, in the economy which is hit by, uh, by the pandemic. And, and why is it important uh, and why is it related to the rule of law in, in Poland? Uh, because the, uh, clearly uh, the, the way how this, this huge money being an expression of, of intra-European solidarity is spent will very much depend on the national institutions and national authorities. And this is also them which will uh, monitor and control the uh, the way of spending, the procedures, define the criteria, and so on and so forth. So you can imagine that uh, this is a major issue in Poland because since we do not have a systemic guarantees of judicial independence, since the uh, Polish courts are very much under siege and under under pressure uh, by the executive, by the Ministry of Justice. Uh, since the Minister of Justice is at the same time a prosecutor general, so basically controls the prosecutor's office completely and is in a position to uh, to nominate, dismiss uh, prosecutors anytime, uh, is is able to. Um, 
promote prosecutors, uh, delegate prosecutors. <laughs> uh, so basically ha has a full, one person in the system has a full control of, uh, of the prosecutor's office and at the same time has a major influence, major influence upon the judicial system works and how the, work, how the courts work. work. Uh, this situation creates a, a systemic risk for uh, for the EU money being spent in Poland, so uh, because you you cannot trust these institutions that they will investigate uh, properly cases of fraud or, or corruption that uh, where when where for like for example state owned institutions state owned enterprises are involved or or local governments controlled by the ruling party or or companies um, affiliated with the with the ruling party. And we have already had plenty of this kind of um, cases over the last uh, couple of years uh, where we saw that, for example, a, a government's fund um, supposed to support local, um, uh, local governments uh, was very much used to support only those local um, authorities which are controlled by the representatives of the ruling party. Uh, that was the only criterion. <laughs> so, so basically, the, the 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 paradox of the situation and uh, something which we are very much worried about at the moment is that this huge solidarity fund of the European Union could be this way or another used for the support, basically, of more and more author autocratic or authoritarian structures of the Polish. Um, of the Polish state, and and this is it, it wouldn't be a unprecedented situation because this is exactly what happened in Hungary, where the Orban system uh, was very much uh, created and and uh, strengthened and 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 uh, uh, designed thanks to the uh, thanks to the EU money. Uh, and you was not able to do anything or not willing to do anything so so i think this is this is a a, a real a real problem and and we are basically these days dealing with with this um, in poland and discussing that because the eu is uh, now about to um, decide whether the polish plan how to use this recovery fund uh, should be ad accepted by the EU or not, and and our goal as non-governmental institutions and um, um, yes activists is basically to ensure that uh, there are enough uh, guarantees in the plan that this money will be monitored in an appropriate way, that it that will be sufficient controls, and that there, that, that the Polish government basically commits to that. <clears throat> in an agreement uh, with the European Union. But I think the risk is quite high that, it, that these provisions won't be sufficient. Uh, and um, so, so this, is, this, is, uh, this is about you know, the rule of law and, and, and its relation to the, to the EU, which I think it's, it's at the moment a, a major, major thing. And here to, 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 to add one point to that, which is very, sort of uh, uh, important and, and uh, which will be a major topic in the Polish politics in the upcoming days, are two or actually three uh, court verdicts which are expected to be announced next week. And they are of uh, immense importance, not just for the Europe, for Poland, but for the for the European Union as a whole. But they they were all of them were triggered by Poland because there will be there is a a motion of the Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki in the Polish Constitutional Tribunal, uh, which is, as you certainly know, a basically an instrument of uh, of the government it's completely controlled by the by by by, by the government and composed of uh, partly also of, of pis uh, politicians um, so this this constitutional tribunal basically always decides 
um, as uh, government wishes it to decide. And so there is a motion of the Polish Prime Minister which, which wants the Constitutional uh, Tribunal to, uh, to, uh, to rule that the Polish Constitution has the primacy over the EU law when it comes to all issues related to the judicial system. So basically, uh, it, it wants the Constitutional Tribunal to say that, uh, that the EU treaty, uh, which allows, for example, the European Commission and the Court of Justice of the European Union to intervene uh, whenever they see that uh, the judicial independence is violated in Poland or in any other EU member state, is not in line with the Polish constitution. Which is, which is uh, if, if, if it happens, it would be an unprecedented move against the very um, fundament or foundation of the European Union. I mean, it, it has never happened in the history of, of the European integration that a, a national court would have declared that the EU treaty is not in line uh, with the national constitution, and uh, and for that reason, it it should not be applied in the country. This is uh, that would be it, it's basically a declaration of war against the whole EU legal system. And there will be yet another Polish uh, the day after. There will be a, a court decision about. Um, uh, yet another motion uh, more I don't want to go into details but going basically in the same direction to say that, that the European Court of Justice which is a major judicial institution in the European Union absolutely indispensable for the coherence of the whole rule of law system in the EU that this uh, Court of Justice should, should uh, put the hands off uh, of the Polish judicial system and then uh, yet again, the after on Thursday, uh, on, um, yes, on Thursday, the, the, this very court, the, the, the European court, um, the, this major European court will decide if, uh, um, a, chamber, if, if a chamber of, um, of the Polish Supreme Court is, uh, can be uh, perceived as an independent court, if it is an independent court because they are um, the way how the, the judges were selected, how they were nominated uh, is appalling and, and basically it's, they were selected by the completely politicized institutions. So, so we have an amassed basically uh, uh, problem of, of, of rule of law also at this very you know, court level. And so, so these decisions, I'm, I'm talking about the decision of the next week because they may strongly influence everything we have been talking here um, when it comes to the relations Poland in the EU. So if, if the things go wrong, I mean, if, the, if the, indeed the Polish Constitutional Tribunal decides as we um, worry that it would, uh, that would be a major blow to Poland's position in the EU and, and will create um, unprecedented conflicts and, and tensions. Uh, um, so, so, that, that's, so this is a warning sort of sign up from myself. And let me uh, uh, come to the third and last point of, of, uh, of my brief presentation. And this is indeed uh, what, uh, what I started with or what Gosha uh, asked me to do. And, and this is to talk about this um, new orientation uh, of, of, the, of Poland's foreign policy and um, or what I called in my article um, the, about the lost compass of, of Poland's foreign policy. Because I, I think it's indeed a very, very interesting um, and sort of disturbing also phenomenon that, that, uh, that we are again in a, in, a, in a very, very important moment, not just uh, in the European uh, politics, uh, which I have already described, but also at the world stage. We have a new uh, U.S. administration uh, in the in the EU, in the in the um, new administration in in Washington. Uh, we had um, the visit of of Joe Biden to Europe a couple of weeks ago. 
which was a major event and a major attempt to revive the West as a community of, um, of democracies, as a, as a community of, of values. Um, and um, after the, 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 the four years of Trump, that was an attempt, perhaps the, the last chance uh, to, to revive the West, really because uh, we, we don't know what will be the next U.S. administration. Perhaps it will be yet another Trump or, or, or someone like. Uh, so if we do not uh, seize this opportunity and if we do not make sure that, that the U.S. And, and the EU and other democracies in the world, including Australia, that they work together, um, and 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 to, to defend the the, the, the Western uh, values, uh, then I think that would be a, a really a, a lost opportunity. And this is something which has been traditionally, of course, um, at the heart of Poland's foreign policy. That was the compass of of Poland's foreign policy after nine, eight, nine, eight, nine. Um, because, um, as I said in the beginning, uh, the, um, Poland was very much focused on the accession to the EU and NATO. And once it happened, 1999, NATO and 2004, uh, to the European Union, Poland's main foreign policy interest was to keep uh, the US and the European Union together. And not to, and uh, there was even this, uh, you know, sort of, uh, metaphor in, in Poland that we, we need to have both the father and the mother. So, so we, we don't, we need to have, this couple should stay together. Uh, and that was indeed uh, very, very important. Poland uh, was, was very much focused on, on defending the transatlantic link uh, to, to uh, make sure that the European Union do, does not drift away from the US. And, so. and now we have a an attempt to indeed to to um, enhance this transatlantic cooperation, and Poland uh, gives very how to say or sends very intriguing signals. Um, uh, the the background of it is um, is quite obvious. Um, Poland um, under the PIS government um, was a main European ally of the Trump administration. Um, the Trump administration, which was, as you will know, betting basically on, um, on uh, European divides and was very much interesting basically in destroying the European Union. I, I think I would put it even so strongly. Uh, so uh, PIS and, and, and the Polish government, which, um, which had a very Eurosceptic stance and, and was... Uh, uh, yes, at, at odds with with, uh, with European standards and, and also in conflict with European institutions and, and main European partners, um, was a very useful um, ally for, for the Trump administration. Uh, and it, I, I don't want to say that, that Poland um, played this role, which uh, Trump, I think, uh, defined for Poland, 100 percent and and it did not basically provoke a, a major divide in Europe and Trump did not achieve uh, his goal but still the level of uh, of the Polish American cooperation would have not been the same uh, under Trump um, without this ideological affinity and and proximity of of, of Trump and the Polish government and without uh, their their rather you know very skeptical stands towards uh, the EU and its institutions. And now uh, uh, with Biden, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, Poland is very, so to say, wrong footed because um, as you perhaps have heard, uh, Duda, the Polish president hesitated even with congratulations to Trump, uh, to, to, to Biden after his uh, successful election. Um, and so far, uh, Biden uh, has only once met Andrzej Duda, um, uh, and it happened in in Brussels uh, 
for, for a couple of minutes in front of a lift uh, and, and they, they had a very, very short uh, conversation requested by the Polish, by the Polish president. Uh, which is a sign of a, uh, a really a, certainly a, a, the, the worst ever uh, state of the Polish American relations. Uh, Biden did not call up uh, Duda uh, for months. Uh, there were literally no contacts between the Polish and American administration. This is something absolutely unprecedented. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, uh, strongly related to the fact that, that, the, that the Biden administration put so much emphasis on the alliance of democracies. Uh, it's, uh, it wants to revive uh, the relations with Europe and is, unlike Trump, interested in a strong Europe, not in a weak Europe. So again, the Polish uh, position uh, of, uh, of a, as a country which is... Uh, rather weakening the European Union um, because of its um, rule of law problems and, and other, um, other developments uh, and, and having very bad relations with Germany and France, the countries Biden wants to cooperate with uh, strongly, it's of course not a good precondition for close relations with the new Biden administration. And um, so at the moment, um, instead of focusing on, on Poland uh, in, in Europe, Biden is, is paying much more attention to its relations with, um, with Germany, uh, which is uh, actually not a bad sign um, as such. Uh, but I think it's, um, it, we are back in a situation from, from Obama time where I remember the, the representatives of, of the U.S. administration coming to Poland and saying that, look, you are, an, of course, an important ally of the U.S. in Europe. You are, you are important for, for NATO, for, you, for the defense, and so on. But, but if you want to be treated as a, as a reliable, serious partner of the U.S., you need to have good relations with Germany and, and trust-based relations with Germany. Uh, because otherwise you are not, not really useful or, or, or you don't make yourself useful for us. So that was a very blunt uh, message which we received from, from, from Washington many times in the past. And I think we are back in situation. And, and of course, our relations with Germany are very, very bad in the moment. This is, of course, not just about the Polish-German relations. Um, don't get me wrong. But, but I think this is an important case. And wh why I'm saying that... Uh, that this is the, these recent maneuvers of the Polish uh, foreign policy are so intriguing is that uh, mm, mm, there are some interesting coincidences. I mean, Biden came to, to Europe and uh, in May, and uh, um, a couple of weeks earlier, we what we witnessed was a major intensification of uh, of the Polish Chinese relations, something which uh, which came across as very surprising and, uh, and sort of um, difficult to, to, to basically to understand. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I, myself, I don't know really exactly how to interpret that, but, th but these are the facts that, that China, which is a major competitor and major rival of, of the US, and was the main issue in the talks between uh, Biden and his uh, European partners um, and because Biden wants the EU to build a common front basically against China with, uh, with, with the US, something he may fail to achieve, but, but, this, is, but, but this is the fact that, that he wants to, um, to have a coalition uh, to confront China. Um, economically, politically, also to some extent, also in security affairs. Uh, and then we have Poland, traditionally a main, a major uh, US ally in Europe, uh, betting on, on the US support when it comes to our defense against the Russian threats, uh, um, having the ambition of inviting more uh, U.S. troops to, to Poland, uh, wanting uh, the U.S. to invest in our, in, in our region and in Poland, and so on and so forth. And we are, just before Biden's visit to, to, to Europe, uh, the Polish foreign minister pays a visit to, uh, to, to China, together with 
his Hungarian and Slovene and um, Serbian counterparts, so two autocratic uh, countries in, in Europe, uh, and uh, asserts uh, his Chinese partners of uh, the willingness to cooperate and uh, does not mention human rights in China uh, and so on and so forth. And, and Duda uh, participated um, as one of the few uh, leaders of, of, uh, from Europe um, in, a, in a summit with Xi Jinping uh, earlier this year the uh, summit of the so-called 17 plus one uh, initiative. This is a cooperation of, uh, of 17 now after Lithuania left the format 16 uh, countries uh, of Central Eastern and Southeastern Europe, um, including the Balkans with China. Um, a format which which is very useful for China because uh, it it provides uh, China in an opportunity to, to um, basically forge closer relations with with a number of smaller European countries and sort of also inf infiltrate them economically and and so on. It's it's not very perhaps very successful, but but still politically uh, important for China in the first place. And Poland was. In the previous year, in, in, in the last few years, was not really very much interested in, in in this in this format because it is of course very much disliked by the U.S. and uh, is at odds with with the U.S. interests. The, the, this is the last thing the U.S. wants uh, to to have more China in Central Eastern Europe. So Poland was for for good reasons rather distancing itself from from this format, and then suddenly. Uh, it rediscovered this format this year, and um, and 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 Duda even participated in, in the summit with Xi Jinping. So there are many more signals of some rapprochement with China. But, but of course, I don't want to say that this is a, a completely new orientation in the Polish uh, foreign policy. I, I can uh, suspect that the reason is to also send some si signal to to Washington that. Um, if Poland is ignored by by the, the new U.S. administration, we can also do our foreign policy uh, differently, and we can uh, we are also open for for some sort of cooperation also with partners um, uh, which are not really uh, you know wished for by 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 the U.S. Uh, but but this is sort of um, I would say incoherent, and I I, I would um, this is why I'm talking about Poland losing its uh, foreign policy compa compass, because at the same time Poland uh, declares that it wants to strengthen um, the its its new foreign policy pet project, which is called Three Cs Initiative. This is this is also a format of cooperation of EU countries from Central Eastern Europe and uh, Romania, Bulgaria, you know, so the, 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 basically the countries of, of our of South, South uh, or, or East European and, and uh, Southeast uh, part of the, of, the, of, of the European Union. Uh, which is uh, meant to um, strengthen the infrastructural ties between those um, uh, countries and economic relations and so on. And, and it's very much focused on inviting the US business and, and the US uh, investments uh, to the region. And, and, and clearly for the, for the US, this Three Seas initiative may be interested, but only if it is clearly directed against China and Chinese influences in the region. Uh, but uh, so you cannot do both. Basically, you cannot have uh, strong relations both with China and and, and U.S. Uh, it's mutually exclusive. Uh, so so the question is, what is actually um, all um, all about? And, um, and and so this is the this is the the, the very intriguing phenomenon, um, and, and this uh, very. Um, weak relations now with the US uh, is something which is very new in the Polish uh, history of the Polish foreign policy and, and 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 I think this is a very open question how how these ties can be mended and how 
um, how Poland, how these these uh, poor relations with, with the U.S. will further influence uh, Poland's uh, Poland's foreign policy. So I perhaps I would uh, I would uh, finish here because it would be probably much more interesting for for you and uh, and but also for me to to to, um, to have a conversation with you and and. Mm, answer your questions or, or hear your comments or reflections. So thank you very much and I'm um, very much for looking forward for the rest of our discussion. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this um, very, very interesting and detailed, you know, within uh, one hour, not even, uh, you were able to really provide us with interesting, in-depth uh, analysis of um, not only external, uh, you know, traditional kind of partnerships that Poland used to have in the past, but also uh, I may call them internal European and this cornerstone of um, Polish security and economic development and, and social policies as well, which EU is, um uh is is uh, is a a truly um a important part of of you know the polish foreign policy so i will now obviously invite everyone to put their hand up or just turn on your uh, microphone and please ask questions or start the discussion janku you first go ahead Thank you very much for a very clear and uh, frightening presentation. Um, I think the uh, situation as seen from Australia uh, looks even worse than probably you uh, presented. It's not just contestation of the uh, European order, uh, not just contestation of the American Biden uh, policies, uh, but uh, basically going in a direction which no one knows. Uh, so my question is, um, how serious, how realistic is a possibility of Kaczynski organizing poll exit? exclusion of Poland from the European Union. It would be a total disaster, comparable only probably to the partitions of Poland historically. Uh, it would create enormous uh, upheavals in Europe, uh, which probably Putin would love to see. Uh, but uh, in my eyes, unfortunately, such a possibility is not unrealistic. Um, and uh, I would like to hear your, perhaps uh, as neutral um, answer to this question and uh, statement uh, because it's something that worries probably not only Poles, but also majority of Europeans and Americans. Thank you. Please go ahead. Would, yeah, would you like me to answer it directly? Yep. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for this for this question. It's of course, uh, the port exit idea um, is a, um, it's something which um, has been discussed in Poland for for a couple of time already for for, for some time already, um, and it's it is a threat which also the opposition played with um, to to portray basically the Chinsky and the PIS as a supporting force which could um, bring us out of the European Union. Am I? My opinion is probably slightly less, uh, I don't know if less uh, uh, pessimistic, because I don't know if my scenario is, uh, is less pessimistic than yours. Uh, because I don't think that Paul exit in the sense that Poland will leave the European Union altogether, 
is very realistic at the moment. I, I think it's it's not, and this is not for the what the what the PIS really wants to achieve, and um, and they are actually very um, strongly opposing it for for good reasons because the 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 whole plan of uh, economic recovery, um, the PIS announced a new plan, the, the Polish deal, recently, uh, depends completely on the on the EU money I referred to. So without the EU money, we can forget about uh, basically our of, of reaching any of the goals we have in the in the next years. And the and the and the and, and PIS knows that very well, and is also very much interested uh, for for if not for for patriotic patriotic reasons, then for for basically very you know particularistic reasons. To uh, to make this project uh, of, of the Polish deal and and Polish economic development a success because this is what what it depends on when it comes to the re-election and and public support. So I think they will be very uh, uh, you know determined uh, not to bring Poland um, out of the European Union. But, but my, and, and also this is uh, because as you very well know, the, the support for the, EU, for the EU membership at least in Poland is huge. And, and this move would not meet uh, resonance in, in, the, in, the, in the Polish uh, population, um, at least for now. Of course, you, we, we can uh, discuss and we can um, uh, consider a scenario where what happens once the current uh, EU budget is over in seven years and the money has been spent, Poland has achieved a, a higher level of economic development it doesn't qualify anymore for huge transfers from the European Union because it's already, you know, a, a, a prosperous country. And what then? Uh, will the EU membership uh, really interesting and attractive for the majority of Poles if the EU money doesn't flow? Um, difficult to predict. I think it still will uh, because of the common market, and and you know the, the common market is um, as important, if if not more important. I think I would even say it's much more important for Poland that the EU funds and and leaving the European Union like like the UK did would basically um, cut us off from the benefits of the common market. And that, that would be a complete disaster. And, and you certainly put into to that as well. So I think, I, I, I think this, is, this scenario is, is not, uh, fortunately, it's not very likely. But the scenario which is, I think, not unlikely, and this is the one I referred to in, in my first point, so that we will stay in the European Union, we will remain part of the European Union, but paradoxically, the European Union as a community of law, a community of democracies, uh, will uh, sort of by default uh, support a autocratization of, uh, of Poland and support the developments which we have observed over the last years because uh, exactly for the reasons I mentioned, so that we will be part of the EU, we will receive EU funds, these funds will flow into some dubious uh, uh, investment funds uh, controlled by the, uh, by the government, will support directly or indirectly um, uh, the, the ruling party and, and, and the government, the EU will not be able or, or will not be willing to do anything about it. And uh, we will uh, uh, basically get deeper and deeper into the mess we are, we are in now. So I, I think this is a very pessimistic scenario, no, and I hope it will not materialize, but this is what worries me, to be honest, much more than this, uh, the scenario of, of Paul Exit. And I think that would be a disaster, not just for us, in Poland, but it would be a disaster for the European Union. Because if you have more and more countries in the European Union 
basically contradicting EU values, uh, um, undermining the primacy of the EU law. Uh, if you have countries which basically are not interested in the EU solidarity and, and uh, do not function according to the EU rules, then you know that will in 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 long run it will undermine the very foundations of the EU and it will bring this project uh, to an end. And and for, for example, I, I think and and why I think this is um, kind of realistic because you, for example, it, now we have a Slovenian uh, Slovenia is the, has the presidency of the the chairmanship of the European Union. This is a country like Poland, basically, perhaps not. I mean, ruled by 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 Slovenian Kaczynski. Uh, and um, also with very strong autocratic tendencies, um, undermining the principles of, of separation of powers and so on and so forth. And in spite of that, the European Union has just agreed, the Commission has just agreed to spend 2.5 billion euro uh, from the recovery fund uh, for Slovenia without any guarantees that, that this money will not be uh, matter of fraud, corruption, so, so, and so, so you know, you, you can, you, if, if this, if this is happening, so I, I can, I can imagine that that Poland could be the next case, and um, so, so this is what, what, what I'm really concerned about, much more than uh, about politics. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Adam. Is Adam. next. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Buras. Um, Welcome to the Zoom. It's good to see your face again. Um, yes, hello. Very good to see hello. you. <laughs> yes, lovely to see you. And thank you for your very interesting presentation. Now, uh, I would like to drill a little bit further on your last um, uh, analysis um, regarding the relations between the European Union and the uh, autocratic government of Poland. Who, in your view, which countries or which prime ministers or presidents in the European Union have sufficient guts and determination, resolve and, and uh, foresight, in your view, to um, drive an anti-peace position and, uh, on the other side, conversely, who are the, the, the weak links, those who uh, would be agreeable with peace just to have a peace and quiet time. So who are the, the fighters on the European Union or, and who are the, uh, the weakies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a that's very, very interesting question. And I, but, but to be honest, it's, it's, uh, the question is quite easy to, to answer. Because there are several, from that point of view, uh, I think there are a couple of groups in the European Union. So they are the supporters of the Polish government. And this is, of course, uh, Hungary, Slovenia. Uh, I think these are the two countries which are clearly on the side of the Polish government, completely. There is a group of countries which are sort of uh, reluctant to... Um, to uh, engage in a conflict with the Polish government or Hungarian government, Slovenian government. Uh, they are reluctant to, uh, to raise these rule of law issues at the EU level for, for a number of reasons. And these are especially the countries of our region, of, of Central Eastern Europe, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, the Pol Baltic states. Uh, some of them, uh, because they have their own problems, uh, um, like Romania and Bulgaria, but, but it sometimes in a way drives them to uh, exactly behave like a good pupil at the EU level. So basically support all of, of, all of these rule of law mechanisms to, to make sure that, that they, they look good um, uh, against the background of what's going on in, in Poland and Hungary. But they are, in general, they are not really, they don't like it uh, that the EU intervenes too much because they, they suspect that they also maybe uh, may happen to be a target of, of those actions. And also, the Central Eastern Europe, uh, of course, is, uh, has some uh, common interests, uh, in, regardless of the rule of law issues, um, when it comes to the you know, economic um, 
developments and, and economic policies. So they, there is a sort of a community of, of faith, community of interest among the Central Eastern European countries. So they don't want to um, annoy uh, such a, an important partner like 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 Poland uh, in a fight which is a very difficult one. I mean, it's a, because it's uh, there is no clear. Mm, solution in sight uh, at the EU level. So it's a very protracted conflict and mm, so it's, it's to, to engage in this fight without a clear prospect of winning it is, is, is also... So, so this is the, the, the second. Then there is a group of fighters as you, as you, as you called them and, and this is the, the group which is even informally uh, called the um, Friends of Rule of Law. And these are especially the Nordic countries, um, Denmark, uh, Sweden, Finland, but also the Benelux countries, uh, the Netherlands uh, and Belgium and also Luxembourg. Mm, yes, and, and so basically those countries are, are, the, uh, are the fighters. So they, they are raising these issues very, very clearly, very strongly. And they insist on, uh, on on rule of law, um, protection of rule of law in the EU, because they are also, like for example, the Dutch government, very much under pressure internally. So by the by the public opinion and the parliament. So they are the, the, the Dutch parliament keeps asking uh, questions the prime minister Rutte um, uh, about the rule of law in in the EU, about Poland, Hungary, and so on, uh, all the time long. So so, the, so this is. Uh, for them, it is also important for, for domestic political. Uh, so this is, this is the friends of the rule of law. And then there is a key um, country, which is the wiki. So it's, uh, uh, mm. it's in, is some, somewhat interested in the rule of law, uh, but uh, not interested in doing anything, and it's Germany. Uh, uh, and, and Germany is, of course, the, the biggest EU member state and the key for, for all, all what's happening in, in the EU. And Germany has been always extremely reluctant to engage in a, in a, in a conflict with Poland over the rule of law for, I would say, for a number of reasons. If I think I would call three. The, the first reason is that uh, Merkel is obsessed by the, um, or has been obsessed by the idea of uh, preserving the EU unity. So basically she, uh, and for, I think for understandable reasons, she has been very much afraid uh, that uh, the European Union could basically break up. That this is a possible scenario. And, and for example, that France, uh, Macron, uh, would not even be very much uh, unhappy about that. Uh, so that uh, that certain that there are certain developments in the EU which drive uh, the EU towards a breakup, and she wanted to pre pre prevent it at any price. And the main price was um, basically ignorance of the rule of law issue. The second reason um, is. Uh, I think um, the economic one, uh, it's not, uh, not unimportant, and, but probably even more important when it comes to the, to the German-Hungarian um, uh, relations, where Germany has uh, so many, or German business has as many uh, interests, economic interests at, at stake in Hungary, the, the automotive industry and so on, that they, they will, did not want to, to provoke, um, to provoke uh, Orban. And, uh, and also the, the third reason is that, um, I think um, it is an extremely difficult fight. And Merkel has been very, always extremely cautious as a politician. And to engage in a fight where you don't have, um, as I said before, a clear prospect of, of victory is, is not her style. <laughs> And and I'm I'm in I'm quite curious what what happens when when we have a new government in Germany. But if uh, the um, next chancellor is is Armin Laschet, the uh, 
from from America's party, I think nothing will change really. Uh, there, there could be a, a shift if if uh, we have a green chancellor in Germany, but it's probably becoming more and more unlikely. So so this is my basically my picture of of how things play out. Thank you. That's excellent. So maybe we could add one more last question. Uh, Martin, please. Thank you very much. This was wonderful and very, very interesting. I wonder if you could speculate a bit. Tusk is back. Uh, and of course, everything changes with every poll. But I wonder if you could talk about on the one hand, what changes you might envisage with policy if uh, peace lost the next election? And secondly, more embedded, how difficult would it be for a new government, an anti-peace government, to make changes given the efforts that peace has made to embed its cadres in the civil service, in the foreign service, and uh, in, in many aspects of institutional and social life. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. That, that these are two fundamental questions. And I think uh, as, as to the first point about what, what may happen if, uh, if the, uh, an anti-PIS coalition wins, of course, this is a scenario which is, uh, still quite far away to be honest even uh, because it, even in spite of, of Tusk's return and some hopes it's it evoked but it's still a long long very long way ahead but I think of course uh, there are some some uh, um, uh, obvious points and some completely open questions and and the obvious points are that yes Tusk will change this uh, or will reinvent Poland's foreign and European policy compass. He will uh, return to Europe, he will put an end to the conflict of the rule of law, he will um, be uh, much more uh, you know, diplomatic at the EU level and interested in, in uh, closer relations with, with Germany and France uh, and also with the Biden administration uh, if the Biden administration is still in power in, in the US or something uh, on, on a, any similar administration. So that, that's, quite, that's quite clear. And, and I think that would be quite easy. I mean, that, that would, and, and he would have an enormous uh, reservoir of, uh, of, of trust in the, in, in, in the world, basically. So that's, uh, that would be his main asset. So the, 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 the foreign leaders would give him a lot of you know, credit. Uh, what uh, what uh, what is much less obvious is what kind of policies uh, domestically, especially uh, Tusk would adopt. He so far has not come up with. Of course, uh, these are his early days as the uh, as the president of uh, or the leader of, of the civic platform. But but uh, he has not come up with any particularly, you know, well-designed ideas for, for Poland's future policy when it comes to the economic policy, social policy, climate policy. So, it's, so it's, it's still very open what his plan for Poland would be. He hasn't presented any political vision and the, the, his only pro program at the moment is basically to, to, to fight PIS. And I, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about it because I think it will certainly not be enough. Uh, I think, he, he, um, of course, I, I, I'm not criticizing him for not having a plan, but, uh, but I think uh, he will not win, or the Polish opposition will not win the next election if this is all about fighting the PIS. Uh, and um, so, so the plan just to get rid of, of Kaczynski will not succeed. So, so now, so, so this is the, 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 the real question is at the moment, what are the ideas which will, uh, which are likely to um, energize the Polish society and, and uh, basically give a new hope that the, the post-PIS Poland would be a better country. 
um, apart from the restoration of rule of law and, and so on, which is an important, as for me, it's, it's an absolutely key issue, but you, one needs to remember that it's certainly not the key issue for the majority of Poles. I mean, this is the, the, the these uh, concerns about the state of democracy, rule of law, and the media freedom and so on, they are, you know, rather an elitist phenomenon. And it's, uh, so, so you need to have a very well thought through social policy, economic policy to, to, to uh, basically confront the PIS in the next election. And, uh, and when it comes to the state structures and, its, uh, and, and, and the uh, possible exchange of elites, I think this is a, that will be a very long process. Uh, and starting with the constitutional issues, um, which are extremely complex, uh, because you have institutions like the Constitutional Court, like the Supreme Court, like the, especially the courts, where uh, you have not just the cronies of, uh, of the PIS, but, but people who are unlawfully uh, occupying certain positions. And they, according to rule of law standards, they need to be removed once we have a new government in place. They simply are illegal. I mean, some, but, but if you have illegal judges, you need to remove them. But how can you remove unremovable judges? Uh, so it's a, it's a paradox that you have, so you need to have a legislation in place which solves this Gordian knot in a way that, that you, you cannot remove, you know, constitutional tribunal by a political decision. Even if you believe that this, or, or you are sure, or you have a certain, uh, you know, legal ground that, that this institution is illegal, but but it's it's a very it's a very difficult uh, difficult situation, and and in order to preserve the rule of law standards, you need to, and and and, and also um, prevent uh, the country from falling into a complete legal chaos. You need to be extremely careful. For example, the idea in Poland, um, I, I talked to lawyers, uh, specialists in, in constitutional law, who developed a plan of, uh, of restoration, the rule of law in Poland, and, and the plan um, uh, basically envisages removal, for example, of, uh, of a number of judges, even from the constitutional court, Supreme Court, and so on. But uh, for the sake of the protection of uh, interest of the citizens, the decisions which have been already made over the last years by those illegally appointed judges, they will stay in place. You can, you, you, as a citizen, you will be allowed to, um, to appeal against them, but they will not be annulled by the force of uh, basic law. So, so I think uh, that's a very rational approach, but it, but, all, but it shows how complicated it will be to, to restore the foundations of the rule of law. And the same, and the same is true for, for the appointments of, of people in the, in the state-owned companies, in the ministries. Uh, I think uh, it is almost inconceivable that to, to have a complete purge uh, that, that basically all the people will be, um, but but a certain verification uh, will be certainly necessary because the this grand corruption, as it is called in uh, uh, in, uh, in social sciences, uh, it's uh, it's already at a very large state uh, scale. So so I I think um, that's a that's a really uh, that will be one of the key challenges for the next coming. Thank you so much. Uh, that, that's a really, really interesting, uh, another interesting um, dilemma and a complex situation that will be, we will be watching very closely here from Australia. Uh, but we very hope very much that next year we will be able to visit Poland as well. Uh, our borders are still closed and we have no idea when <laughs> they're going to open. So, but we all have some, uh, uh, close relatives in Poland and I would love to go and actually speak to people and have those conversations that you can have about the state of of, of uh, Polish um, system and policies and so on. So uh, I would like to 
thank you and please join me in thanking uh, Mr. Piotr Buras for being with us tonight and today. Um, thank you for uh, explaining and exploring with us the different dimensions of Polish foreign policy. And uh, as I said, we will be uh, looking and watching and reading uh, very closely from afar and um, hoping for um, uh, smart solutions and smart partnerships. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure uh, being hosted by you and I uh, hope we will have an opportunity to meet in, uh, in Poland or in Australia. That uh, would be fantastic. Soon. And obviously I will be in touch very, very shortly. Thank you and very have much. a good day, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Gosha. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Gosha. Thank you, Gosha.